while we wait for everyone to get adjusted, if you could just put in the chat where you're uh, chiming in from tonight. Hello, Connecticut. Huh. Woo, Texas in the house. <laughs> New York, Indiana, Maryland, another Texas. All right, so tonight we're excited to bring Nick back to y'all. And again, thank you, Nick, for taking the time and all of your expertise to um, educate our families on such a tolling topic. Tonight's topic is going to be going over the SATs, ACTs, and understanding the test optional piece. So with that being said, you are welcome to begin, Nick. Great, thank you so much. Um, do you think that you could make me the host so I could share my presentation? Oh, it looks like I am, awesome. Yeah, so uh, once again, thank you guys for uh, having me. Um, my name is Nick, I'm the owner of Curve Breakers. We are a New York-based uh, SAT, ACT, and college prep company. And today I will be, or tonight rather, I will be talking about uh, the SAT, ACT, and uh, test optional. Uh, feel free to, you know, throw in any questions as things, uh, as I go along, because obviously there, you know, a lot of new stuff here. Um, as many of you probably know, the SAT is changing, and I'm going to go over all of that. Um, I actually sat down for about two hours today and took the digital SAT myself, which, <laughs> which was fun. Uh, and I have a lot of interesting feedback from that. So, you know, if anyone has any questions that, you know, as we go along, I think there's going to be time for questions at the end as well. So let me just share my screen here. Did everyone see that? Awesome. So, you know, not to spend too much time, you know, talking about myself, but what we do is we work with, you know, mostly schools and uh, private individuals on SAT, ACT prep. Uh, so that's really our main area of expertise that, and, you know, I guess college prep. Uh, one of our core goals is to try to provide these resources uh, to everybody. So, you know, a lot of times uh, these resources are very expensive, as you probably know. And one of our core goals is to kind of provide this information and also preparation for uh, for, for many different students, uh, you know, no matter what their their budget is. So, you know, that's kind of the angle that I'm I'm coming from, just so you know. What am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about what has changed with the SAT. Uh, and obviously a lot has changed. I'm going to talk about the new digital exam structure, um, new question types, and the Blue Book app, which is the app that you have to use to take the SAT now. I'm going to give you a comparison of the three tests and talk about how the preparation has changed. I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, test optional and what that means. So um, a lot of stuff we're going to try to cover today. So what what is not changed about the SAT? As you probably remember, back in the day when we went through the uh, you know the process, the SAT was out of sixteen hundred uh, for a ten year period. Uh, it changed to uh, twenty four hundred, and now uh, since two thousand and fifteen, it's back to sixteen hundred. And now even with the new test, it's still going to be out of sixteen hundred. Most of the questions and the content of the exam remains the same. So, you know, as you probably remember, uh, what does the SAT cover, right? Algebra, geometry, trigonometry on the math side. Uh, on the English side, it covers grammar, word choice, um, a bit of vocabulary, uh, reading comprehension, you know, understanding the main points, so on and so forth. The thing that's changed most since when, you know, anyone that's like a parent probably went through it is that the emphasis on vocabulary has definitely gone down. So uh, depending on how old you are, like if you're my age, I'm 37. Uh, when I took the SAT, there was a ton of vocabulary on the test. There was a lot of vocabulary based questions uh, that has kind of been lessened significantly. Uh, same thing for the ACT there. You know, there are a few vocabulary based questions, but they're more so testing you on commonly known words 
rather than testing you on ridiculous uh, vocabulary words. So uh, that's one positive change. It's something that's similar with both tests. Uh, the format of the SAT is changing drastically. So, you know, since now we have the digital SAT, I'm going to explain all about how that works. Uh, the format has changed, but like I said, the content has not changed very much. Uh, there's still reading comprehension questions. They're just much shorter, and I'll show you what those look like. Uh, but, you know, understanding text, reading for context, understanding main points, all very important to, um, to taking the SAT or the ACT. So some of the things that have changed about the process. So the SAT is now an adaptive app-based test. So the days of taking the SAT on a Scantron with a paper and pencil, those are now gone, right? Now when we're taking the SAT, we're going to be taking it on an app called Blue Book um, and ACT will still be done on paper. There is actually a digital ACT, but it's not really given around here very much. So um, most students in the United States will not have access to take that yet. Obviously that's something that may change in the future, but for now the ACT is typically gonna be taken on paper and pencil and it's with a Scantron, the old school bubbling in the correct answer. Whereas the SAT is done on a, on a, a computer uh, or a, a similar device and you're going to have to access a certain program that you have downloaded on your computer. Um, so it's done more like a college test when they have like the lockdown browser on your computer and you can't use the internet and so on and so forth. Uh, instead of, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to go through the various sections on the test, but there's four sections on the paper SAT. Um, that's what I'm referring to as the old paper SAT. Uh, and the ACT both have four sections. The digital SAT, it has two main sections with two modules each. So there's still four distinct pieces of the test you need to do, but it's really two sections instead of four sections. So, um, you know, that's not really much of a change. It's kind of more of a change in name than anything else. Uh, but now some of the bigger changes is a calculator is permitted on all math questions for the SAT, it's also permitted for all math questions on the ACT. That's different from the paper SAT, the old SAT, which is being given up until December. Uh, on that test, you actually have a part where there is no use of a calculator. You actually have a no calculator math section where you have to put your calculator down and do the questions. Uh, that is a change I think that students like. Students typically do not like uh, the no calculator math section. I mean, some do, you know, some do, but I would say on average, students find that part to be a little bit, you know, difficult or annoying. So that's why the test has changed. ACT, you don't have that problem. Uh, instead of the long, and you probably remember anyone that took the SAT or ACT for that matter, the long reading passages where you have to read something that's very long and then answer, you know, 10 questions about that. Um, you know, um, I think people find that to be difficult. You know, that, that's that been a, a source of, of complaint for students. Um, you know, now uh, we won't have that. We'll have much shorter reading passages. So instead of a whole passage of, you know, six or seven paragraphs by, uh, you know, a speech by Abe Lincoln, you'll now have one short paragraph where you have to read something and analyze it. So that's really changed the style. Some students do struggle with, you know, reading long-winded passages and, you know, keeping their attentiveness and understanding those. So that's a positive change for those students. You know, other students don't have an issue with those kind of passages. So really a person by person thing. And, you know, that's one of the big points about, you know, SAT versus ACT, which one should I do? You know, which one is easier? Which one is better? That's a very individualized question. And I'll get to, you know, later how we would answer that question. So um, it's an important one, right? Because who really wants to take you know, the SAT, then the ACT, then the SAT, then the ACT. That, you know, that's very difficult on students. So one of our main goals of this process is to avoid taking too many tests and gear ourselves towards the one that we feel better and more comfortable with. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one of my goals and should be one of your goals as well. Another benefit of the digital SAT is that the results will be available faster. So typically it takes about I would say 10 to 14 days, sometimes a little bit longer to get your SAT or ACT results back. Usually if you take it on Saturday, you have the results back the next Friday. So not the Friday right after, but the Friday after that. So that's, you know, 
uh, about two weeks. Now the results will be apparently available in days. I don't know exactly what that means, maybe five days, something like that. But uh, that is something that I think people really like. They'd rather know their score faster. Do I need to study again? Do I need to continue to prepare? Do I need to take it again? You'll know that more quickly. Uh, and then my last point on what has changed is that the uh, the SAT has uh, discontinued the QAS reports. What does that mean? Um, QAS means question and answer service. So basically, when you took the SAT you, or and, and also the ACT, it's not called the QAS, but they have something similar. You were able to pay an extra you know, small fee of maybe like $20, $25 to access your test questions from the exam on certain exam administrations. So a few times a year, they'll let you actually access your, your, your test and your answers. And what that enables you to do is that it enables you to review them and use that to prepare, right? You could see what mistakes you made. You could see, you know, where you went wrong. You know, maybe you made, you know, some careless errors. Maybe there's some things you didn't know. Uh, and that gives students a really good way to prepare for the test. The problem with that is that, um, now they're not doing that anymore. So basically, when you take the SAT, you won't have access to that. You won't be able to review your questions or what you what you've done. So you know, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but I think what it does is it makes it a little bit harder for students to prepare. They're not going to be able to review their results, and that means they're going to have to seek outside measures to understand where they're at, what their scores you know, what their score is and why it isn't what they want, right? So, um, you know, we provide those kind of measures. We have a diagnostic SAT platform. We have diagnostic ACT tests. Students take those to see how they're performing and what they need to improve upon. But that has been discontinued, which is definitely um, not the best for the students. So here is a little bit about the new digital SAT exam structure. So, uh, as I said, it's an adaptive test. What does that mean? Well, basically, in the past, when you took the SAT, uh, let's say you were taking the math part and you got 10 wrong, right? You answered all the other questions correctly, but uh, it was actually, um, it was 58 questions, right? So out of 58 questions, if you got 10 wrong, you got 48 out of 58. You could look at a scale online uh, or you could look in a book, like a, you know one of the SAT books, and you could actually grade your test. And maybe that comes out to a 680 out of 800, right? That was very simple, right? You knew your raw score, which is basically how many you got right. And you could correlate that to a scaled score and know what your SAT score would be, right? That's like where you practice, right? You could do, the, do a test and see what you would get. Now the test is adaptive. So basically you take half of the math and then you take a short break. And during that short break, uh, the app, because now we're doing this on a computer, remember, grades your performance, right? So it grades your first half of the math, we'll call it. If you do really well on that portion, they're going to feed you a harder second module. If you do poorly on that first portion, they're going to feed you an easier second module. So the first module is kind of like a mixture of easy, medium, and hard questions. If you do well, the second module will be mostly medium, hard. And if you do poorly, the second module will be mostly easy medium. Now you're probably thinking, well, why would they do that? Like, how is that fair? Because if I'm doing better, why would I get harder questions? Well, the answer is your score, right? If you move on to the harder module, you're going to have a much higher score than if you don't move on to the harder module. If you move on to the easy module, your score is capped at a certain level. So maybe your maximum score is a 630 if you move on to the easy module. Whereas if you move on to the hard module, your score has a floor, like the lowest it could be would be maybe like a 630. And if you do well in the second module, it will be even higher. So uh, it sounds unfair, but it actually to the benefit of the students. Now, the next question is, why are they doing this? Like, what's the point? Well, the point is, it sounds fancy and cool, and it's a talking point. And, you know, for students, for parents, I think it's something to talk about. It, you know, it makes it look high tech, so on and so forth. But the real reason is they're able to shorten the test by doing this. So the theory is if you do well in the first module, then they can just skip you to the hard questions, right? Because they know you know how to do the easy and medium questions. What that enables them to do is just have fewer questions. So 
instead of the SAT being three hours and change, now it's only two hours and 14 minutes. So that's a huge benefit to students. I think the students that I've seen take the digital SAT have really liked it much better. Um, I actually took the digital SAT today on my computer and it was still, you know, it was still the SAT, but it definitely, it only, you know, it, it took much less time and it was significantly less painful. So I think that's the main benefit is it shortens the test and students like it more. So it works the same way in English and the same way on math. You know, you have module one, every student gets that. Depending on how you perform, you get a different module two. If you do well, you get the hard one. If you do poorly, you get the easy one. That's basically how it works. Uh, one of the other big differences now is there is a in-app calculator. So because we're using a computer, they actually give you a calculator. So you don't need to bring your own calculator to the test. You can bring your own calculator to the test, but you don't necessarily have to bring your own calculator to the test. Um, the in-app calculator is amazing. Um, I didn't know much about it before this happened. This is actually a pretty popular calculator. Like many students say they use this in school. Uh, I did the test today and I could tell you from firsthand experience, the calculator is incredible. It's an amazing calculator. It's so easy to use and it enables you to answer so many of the questions incredibly easily. Uh, that's really important because students are going to need to know how to use that. Uh, if you do know how to use it, it's an amazing tool to boost your score. If you don't know how to use it, I think you're probably going to suffer because many of the questions, at least for me, actually required the use of the calculator. Whereas in prior years and on the ACT, you don't really need a very complicated calculator. It's not that helpful, right? On this test, it's designed to have the calculator and it's like extremely, um, extremely helpful. So uh, I think that's a huge benefit to students, especially if you don't have, you know, a fancy calculator is like $150, right? So if you don't have a fancy calculator given to you by your school, you don't want to buy one, you can use the fancy calculator that they give you, which is amazing. And here is a, a, a comparison between the three tests. So we have the traditional SAT, which is the one that's, you know, on paper being given until December. You have the digital SAT, which starts in March. And then we have the ACT, which is the same ACT that we've had for many years. Um, you could see some of the big differences, right? Uh, timing for the paper and pencil SAT, it's a three hour test. You have 154 questions and you have several small breaks. Uh, the digital SAT is only two hours and 14 minutes, only has 98 questions and you get one break in the middle. The ACT is about three hours. You have 215 questions to do. That sounds like a lot it is. And you also have a few small breaks, right? Uh, the format you can see there, uh, SAT, traditional paper SAT, reading, writing, which is basically grammar, uh, math with no calculator and math with a calculator. Those are the four sections. The digital SAT, you have reading and writing as one section with two modules and math as one section with two modules. Uh, on the ACT, you have four sections. They're in a different order. Uh, English, math, reading, and science. English, once again, is mostly grammar. Uh, math, we all know what that is, reading comp, where you read a passage and answer questions, and then the science part, and that's, uh, you know, a big uh, difference between the tests, right? SAT on both versions, the old version and the new version, do not have a science part. Um, to talk a little bit about that, you know, you don't really need to know a lot about science to do the science part of the ACT. That's it's kind of a funny thing. I mean, it sounds like when you be tested on biology and chemistry and the things you learn in school, not really. It's more of a reading and analysis task. So you're reading a passage about science, you're analyzing it, you're you know looking at graphs and you're answering questions about the graphs and the text. There's really not a lot of scientific knowledge that you need to do that, uh, which is actually helpful. I mean, it would be very difficult if they had a real science test of biology, chemistry, physics, and they put you know astrophysics on the ACT, but you don't need to actually know anything because they basically teach it all to you. It's like right there in front of you. You have the information you need. You just have to use it to answer the question. So that's more of, a, of a, a reading task, right? You're reading the passage about the science experiment, you're reading the graphs and you have to answer the question. So, you know, that's something that a lot of students say, oh, I don't really like science, I don't wanna do the ACT. Uh, I would highly recommend that you at least try it because it, it doesn't work that way. You know, if you're not good at science in school, that doesn't mean you won't be good at the science on the ACT. Big difference in math, you know, on the traditional paper and pencil SAT, once again, the math is two sections, one with a calculator, one without. Uh, on the digital SAT, math is just one section with two modules. 
And then on the ACT, math is one section and you do get a calculator the whole time. So, you know, moving towards more of a similar um, concept in math. Here are some more just comparisons for your knowledge. Uh, the reading and writing. So, re and writing really is English grammar and writing style. On the traditional paper SAT, that's two separate sections. Uh, so you have the reading section, then you have the writing and language English grammar section. On the digital SAT, they're combined. So the, your English scores comprise of both of those. The questions are intermixed. So you don't know if you're getting a reading and writing question or a reading question or a writing question or something else, right? Uh, on the ACT, the reading and English are two separate sections, just like the old paper SAT. What resources are there available for you to prepare for these tests? Well, for the old paper SAT, they publish tons of practice tests. They put them on their website, College Board. You know, here's 10 practice tests. And we use those with students. And we, you know, students can use them on their own. You can buy books. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, for the digital test, there's only four exams in an app. You have to sign up and access the app to do them. And they're good. that's the test I did today. It's, you know, it's helpful, but at the same time, that's not as much information and they don't really seem like they plan on releasing that much. So what happens is students that need to find their own way to prepare, which creates a problem, prepare, which creates a problem, right? So uh, we have our own digital assessment that has 10 tests in it. So there's that. Um, there's books that you can get. Our book is coming out soon. I mean, there's going to be a lot of books and stuff, but there's not a lot of official materials, which is a little bit of a problem. We always want to use official materials whenever possible. Uh, and the ACT, you know, that test has been around for so long. There's, you know, tons of free stuff online. Like you don't have to really worry about finding a way to prepare for the ACT. If you do a little Googling, there's tons of stuff, especially free stuff that you can utilize. So um, that's really good. All right, so this is a little bit of a snapshot of what the old paper SAT looks like. So you can see this, this passage actually, we're, we didn't put the whole thing here, but you can see it goes down to line 95 here. Um, there would actually be probably another two columns. So it would have been this whole slide basically would have been the passage. And then um, you have the questions. We only show three, but there's usually 10, right? So uh, you have a big passage and then 10 questions. A lot of students found that to be very annoying. And the reason is, you know, say you just don't gel with the passage, like you don't really understand what the passage is about, then you have 10 questions that you feel really, un, you know, you feel a lack of confidence for, for 10 straight questions. You don't really know what the passage is about. And then you struggle and you get a lot of them wrong. And then it kind of like, you know, it could snowball. Uh, so that was something that students definitely didn't like about um, the, the digital, uh, sorry, the paper SAT. The digital SAT solves that problem by doing this, right? So they just have one little passage here. It's actually um, bullet pointed notes. So a totally different style here, right? And you have to read this set of bullet points, right? So the student takes these notes. And then the question is, the student wants to introduce Catherine Halverston's book to an audience already familiar with the Atlantic Monthly. Which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish its goals? So this is the new style of reading an English question, right? So. We're not using these big passages anymore. We're using one little blurb, and then you have to answer some questions. And then here's a different style of question. Um, you could see, you know, you just have a paragraph, right? Early 1800s, about the Cherokee scholar, which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. And you could see these words, widespread, careful, unintended, infrequent. Those are words that they think that students should probably know. Uh, I would probably agree with that. Most of those words are pretty similar, are pretty pretty simple, excuse me. Um, we're not using really complicated vocabulary. So that's what they're doing. They want you to be able to place these more everyday words into sentences and see how the sentence would work, make sure that the sentence and paragraph work properly. So this is the kind of new style of question, much shorter than reading. Imagine reading three times what this says here and then having to answer these questions. If you get thrown off, you're gonna be thrown off on 10 straight questions. Whereas here, if you don't get this one, no big deal, right? The next one's going to be totally different, totally unrelated. So it's not a problem at all, right? So uh, I think students are really genuinely uh, enjoying that change. Uh, we have had many students take the diagnostic assessment for the digital SAT, take the diagnostic assessment for the paper SAT, take the diagnostic assessment for the ACT. Almost all the students have preferred the digital SAT. They say it's easier. Um, it's not easier. The scores are coming out the same. 
just throwing that out there. But at the same time, to have one less hour of testing and much shorter passages and so on and so forth, it feels significantly easier. So it's like much, you know, it's much less painful. And I think that's why students say it's quote unquote easier because they're just experiencing less effort and less pain while they're doing the test. It's not as like mentally racking, right? Because you only have 98 questions to do. There's an ACT 215 questions to do more than double the number of questions in in three hours. It's just a lot, right? It just leaves you numb at the end mentally, right? So uh, I think I think that's a hugely positive change. This is how you actually take uh, the digital SAT, the Blue Book app. I can show that actually later towards the end, what it looks like and how it works. But there's an app you have to sign up for. A lot of schools are loading this onto kids' computers. So they're, you know, they're downloading the app for the students so that they have it. A lot of students are already using this with AP exams and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, definitely got to familiarize yourself with that. So we have a lot of partners, uh, a few partners in, in Asia. The digital SAT is already being given in Asia, right? So, you know, China, India, they're already taking the digital SAT. Um, so we've gotten feedback from those partners and what they said about the test. And they basically proclaimed that students that are not uh, applying with a digital assessment or not studying with a digital assessment are struggling to take the test. So there are paper tests. There are, you know, you could print it out and do it by hand. That's not really replicating what the real test will be like. You have the integrated calculator, you know, you have tools and so on and so forth. You want to utilize those to your advantage. The students that aren't practicing with that are struggling on the test. Uh, you know, preparing for standardized tests is all about practice, right? Repetition, right? The questions are very repetitive. They ask sometimes three or four of the basically the same question over and over and over in succession, especially on the English part. I just did the test today. There's four, four straight of these kind of vocabulary questions. Now, of course, the words are different and the blurb is different, but they're asking you the same things over and over and over again. So by doing that repetitious practice and really you know, preparing yourself for the exam by doing questions and practice tests and reviewing them, that's really how you prepare for this kind of test. Um, you, know, you can't just study math and English and necessarily do well in the SAT. You know, it's like kind of a hybrid between school and a sport. You, know, like you could be the most athletic person of all time, but not be good at a certain sport because of the techniques involved or certain attributes, right? We all have our different strengths and weaknesses. You know, you have to learn the game. Like when you take a sport, when you take up a sport, you have to learn, you know, I could be really strong at, you know, at hitting something. That doesn't mean I'm going to be good at tennis, right? Because there's a technique involved. Same thing for the SAT, right? You could be really strong in math and English, but there's a technique involved in taking the test. You have to learn the techniques and learn the tendencies and you have to learn the game. You know, like people that play a sport, you know, kind of can predict things, you know, other players' tendencies and you know how to react and you kind of know the flow of the game, right? You can know what to expect at a certain point in time, right? With the SAT, it's the same thing. Like you need to know what to expect the entire time by being prepared for taking this kind of assessment. So how to prepare for these two tests. So if you do choose to take the test, I, I highly recommend everyone tries it. And to talk a little bit about test optional, um, which is a good time to talk about it. Basically what that means is if, your test score is not what you want it to be, you don't have to send it to a lot of colleges. Now, there are still a lot of colleges that are test required. Um, that number seems to be going back up. That was kind of a COVID thing. Like they couldn't expect kids to take the SAT and ACT during COVID because of you know obvious issues with schools being shut down and so on and so forth. So they let kids apply without tests, right? So you know if you're applying to X college and they are quote unquote test optional, you don't have to send them your SAT score. Now they still have a average SAT score for the school and they're still getting SAT scores from a lot of kids. So, you know, not sending it, it's not necessarily means you're, you're out of the picture, you're not gonna get in, but you'd probably have a better chance with a good score than with no score. Um, if you have a, a score that's lower than what they require, so say the school's average score is a 1300, if you have a 1300-ish or above, you wanna send that to them, they're gonna want that, right? If you have a 1200, you probably wouldn't want to send it to them and you would want to do what's called test optional, right? Apply test optional. And in that instance, they would not count or look at your SAT score because it would be a negative to you. So they don't want you penalized for something that's a negative, right? 
but at the same time, you will benefit if it's positive. So if the school's average was a 1300, if you had a 1200, definitely don't send it. If you have a 1400, you without a doubt want to send that to them because that will result in you probably being accepted, right? Because you're above the marks that they're looking for, right? So uh, that's kind of a little bit of breakdown what test optional is. Now, okay, so then the question is, how do I manage all this? Like, what do I do? Uh, I would try the SAT and ACT, right? In an informal setting. Like we give these practice tests every weekend online. Um, you know, the, the SAT is digital. We also proctor online ACTs and we send you the materials. You know, you can take the test and it's the Scantron. We grade it and we give you back an analysis and report. I would just try both, right? If you have a pretty good score on one of them, you probably want to try to prepare for it and send it. If you, you know, just do terribly on both, then maybe it's not for you and your better option will be to apply without the test. But at the same time, you should just give yourself that chance, you know? So um, you still have the option at the end of the process, even if you prepare and study for it and you, you know, your score is, say, you're, you know, you're applying to multiple different schools and some of them require a 1300 and some of them require a 1200 and some of them require a 1400. You can send it to some and then not send it to others. That's totally fine, right? So having that in your corner, having that, that option, right, is hugely beneficial to you when applying to college, right? So um, you definitely want to give yourself that chance to at least try it, try to take the test, see how you do. Um, and, you know, and, and if it doesn't work out, no harm, no foul whatsoever. Like you can literally still apply without the test. Now, obviously, like I said, there are some schools that don't allow that. Like you do have to send a test. You know, that's a different story. You know, if your score is lower than what they're requiring, you know, you probably won't get in but you could still, you could still try. Right. And same thing with test optional, you know, they're, they're looking at more than just your test score, right. They're looking at your grades, they're looking at your extracurricular activities. They're looking at, you know, your essays, right. All, if all those things are incredible and you just don't have the test score, you probably will still get in. Um, if those things aren't up to par, then you do probably need the test score, you know, and depending on how selective the school is, it could be easier or harder. I mean, some of these schools now, unfortunately have, you know, 5% acceptance rates. So if five out of a hundred people are going to get in and it's Harvard, those are probably going to be students that do have really high test scores. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, you want to position yourself the best you can. So, like I said, how to prepare, you take the SAT, you take the SA ACT, you take a look at it, you see which one you're better at, and then you try to prepare for that one. Uh, there's different uh, preferences in different states. So like, for example, in say like Louisiana, most kids take the ACT. That's just how it works over there. It's a required test, you know, by the state, um, almost all kids take it and it's uh, used for other purposes. In New York, for example, almost everybody takes the SAT. Some kids do, do the ACT, but you know, it's more of an SAT state. Like that's what people prefer. You don't have to go with that. You know, you could do whatever is best for you. That's what kind of what we do. What I do every day is I advise people as to what's a better path for them. You know, you could do this for free, right? We give them these tests for free. You can do these some of these tests for free online. Like I took the digital SAT for free online today and you could evaluate it that way. Um, there's tons of free resources out there in terms of how to prepare. You could use Khan Academy, something called Khan Academy. It's a free resource you can use uh, for the SAT. Uh, and that um, helps you prepare, right? There is also an ACT Academy. I think there's a fee for that though. Uh, when you are preparing, you wanna be careful um, for anyone pitching a, a guarantee to you. Um, a lot of times those are just really marketing gimmicks. Uh, you know, it's like when you're dealing with a human and human error, nothing really can be guaranteed. Obviously, you know, uh, you know, the largely uh, large increases will come from students preparing, but you could just have a bad day. You know, you could be sick, right? So then, okay, I want my money back for my guarantee. And then basically it's impossible to get, you know, you have to take another test and send it to them. And it takes months and months and months and putting your child through all this, these jump through all these hoops to basically get your money back, which is never going to happen. So um, I would just be careful with things like that. Those are usually a bad sign. Uh, practice makes perfect. So, you know, practicing, doing practice questions, doing timed practice, that's really the number one free way to prepare for the SAT. Um, you know, obviously with us, we provide tools and diagnostics and so on and so forth, but you can even just do that on your own, right? So um, that's some of the great ways to prepare. 
the three factors to really improve your SAT ACT score would be number one, diagnosing yourself. So doing a pretest, looking at how you score. Number two, coming up with a schedule and you know finding time to study. You want to plan out your test dates. So okay, I'm looking at taking the March SAT. Right, I want to I want to backtrack and start studying soon. Right, if I was taking the March SAT, if I was advising a student, I would say you probably want to start now, if not extremely soon, to prepare for that test, so you have enough time to prepare for it. Um, if I'm taking the February ACT, I probably want to start down. You know, if I'm taking the June SAT, I probably have a little bit of time, but you know, usually want to take the test a few times, right? You know, maybe you want to take it two or three times to optimize your score. So in that instance, you know, you want to give yourself ample time to prepare for those tests and make sure that you're, that you're ready. So, you know, one thing I'll say is this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, I've, I've worked with thousands of people. Uh, we work with like 40 school districts in all different states. Um, students that try to cram it all in the minute before the test, or the week before, or even the month before, tend to struggle because it's just very hard to wrap your head around all this that quickly. Um, if you give yourself more time and you kind of spread things out and you, you're more reasonable as a student, like you carve out a few hours a week to do this, then you'll be really successful and you'll get a huge score. So uh, I think that that's something that I just wanted to kind of point out. In terms of how to prepare for the test, you know, you want to take into consideration your own learning style, your how much time you have, your budget, um, what score the schools are requiring of you uh, or they want, depending on what schools you're applying to. Sometimes it's the best way to do this is build backwards, right? Think about this is my dream college. You know, I really want to go to, you know, University of Florida, right? Uh, what score do they need? How can I get myself in? No, I really want to go to this school. Okay. How do I, what, what's, what are their scores? What are my grades look like compared to the grades they want? You know, how, am I competitive? What score do I need to be extremely competitive? And then you can think, okay, I'm starting at a 1200. I need a 1400 for this school. Someone like myself can tell you how much work it would take to get to that point. You know, uh, obviously a lot of students self-study for these tests. Like I said earlier, there's tons of free materials online, free you know, practice tests, um, YouTube videos, and so on and so forth. Um, you have group classes. Uh, those are obviously a little bit more expensive. You know, I think a good price for a group class is something in the, you know, five to six hundred dollar range. I think if it's, you know, fifteen hundred dollars, is probably overpaying. I mean, that's just a lot for a group setting. Because if you're at that price point, then you're looking more at what the price point would be for private tutoring, which is much more expensive, but you know, it's more personalized. Uh, so you know, if, depending on how much you want to spend, uh, you can kind of find something that's a good fit for you. Uh, I always encourage people to take advantage of the free stuff, no matter what they are doing, because a lot of it is very good. And um, especially something like the free diagnostic test that we do, so on and so forth, can be extremely helpful in getting the ball rolling, getting started, figuring things out, or just general preparation. So um, I highly recommend you use those as well. So does the SAT matter? So there's, we talk a little bit more about test optional here. So now, and, and it's a big change from when we went through this, uh, anyone that's parent age or, you know, my age or older, um, maybe we apply to two to five schools, maybe seven at most, you know, uh, it just, you just didn't need to apply to 15 schools. Now, a lot of kids are applying to 15, 20 schools. Um, there's something called the Common App, which is basically a way that students can, um, you know, uh, you know, um, basically uh, send in a large number of applications very easily. So you fill out all of your, um, you know, personal information, your address, where you live, you know, uh, your social security number, blah, 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 all the personal stuff one time. So instead of having to write that on 15 different applications by hand, you just write it once. Right. And then all that is in there. And then if a school doesn't have any extra essays or anything like that, you write one essay and then boom. Right. Your applications are sent out. So I have students that I work with on this part of the process send out eight applications in one day. You know, um, so a lot of the deadlines are now, you know, November 1st, uh, October 15th, November 1st, and November 15th are, are a lot of deadlines for college applications. Kids are sending in five, six at a time. Right. So. By the time they get to November 15th, they may have sent in 15 applications already, you know? Um, so 
very, uh, uh, very different times. And that requires different measures. I think with students applying to so many schools, the acceptance rates go down, right? So instead of a college getting 20,000 applications, they're now getting 40,000 applications. So if they don't have more dorms. That means they have to take fewer percentage of people, right? So then that makes it harder to get into the school. And then you have to apply to more schools. So it creates this cycle. It's like the college gets more applications. The acceptance rate goes down. I apply to more schools as a student. Colleges get even more applications. The acceptance rate. So it's like we're in this kind of vicious cycle. I don't know when it's going to end, but um, it's become very challenging for applying to college. So um, how do you evaluate whether you should go test op optional or not? If you are applying to very uh, like non-competitive schools, so schools with like 75% acceptance rate or higher, you could probably get away with going test optional, right? Um, if you're applying to schools that are test blind, there are a few schools that are what's called test blind, which basically means they will not look at, even just look at it all, an SAT or ACT score, then you definitely don't need it, right? If you just simply don't do well on this kind of test, then your best choice would be to not send them your score, right? So uh, in those instances, test optional is a great thing. And I, I'm personally a huge proponent for it. I think it's great to give students an opportunity, especially students that are amazing students and just don't do well on tests to still get into some of the schools they want. Um, I think it's a great thing. Uh, that said, you have to be realistic about your prospects of getting into a very selective school without a test, right? If a school is very selective, you're probably gonna have a much better chance with the test than without. Um, if you want scholarships, a lot of the scholarships are uh, you know, tied to SAT and ACT scores. If you're applying to very specific competitive program, you know, like pre-med, nursing, uh, finance, occupational therapy, physical therapy, economics, whatever. I'm just making a bunch of examples of difficult college majors, right? They're going to be more inclined to take kids with test scores to nursing than they will to English. And the reason for that is at the end of nursing, you have to take a hard test, right? So they want people that, that are going to pass that test, right? They don't want to take a bunch of people and have them not pass the test, and then they look bad, right? So uh, that's a lot of the reason why you know, a lot of more challenging programs and things like that really do look for kids with SAT scores. And if you review college websites, you know, they'll tell you a little bit of honesty about how it works. I mean, they'll usually just tell you, do whatever you want. And it's up to you. They don't tell you about the consequences of doing whatever you want. You know, it's like, you think about a, a, a ridiculous, but good example, right? What, what do you think a college would think if you sent in your college application GPA optional, like you just didn't want to tell them your GPA. I mean, they're, they're, you, what, what do you think they're going to think, right? They're going to think it's probably not good. That's why he or she doesn't want to tell me. What if you sent in your college application extracurricular activity optional? Well, if you had really great extracurricular activities, you'd want to tell us about them, right? So that probably means you don't do any extracurricular activities. So we're, that's not good. We don't like that, right? That's not good. So, you know, we, we you're not sending us your test score. We know it's bad, right? So then we just have to, even though they don't have your test score, they have that assumption in their mind, you know? So there's something to think about. So what is diagnostic score data? How do you use it? So basically at the beginning of, uh, of the SAT, ACT prep cycle, if you, if you, you know, do want to try it out and I recommend that you do, you should take a realistic diagnostic test. We do give those. And basically what you get is you get a score, right? And this is a digital SAT. It shows the student score. It shows how they did on module one. So you can see module one, uh, they didn't do as well. So they got the easy, you can see easy module two. And then for the math part, you can see the score is higher. Module one, they probably did better on. And then they got the hard module two. Great job. Your performance on module one unlocked the module two hard and increased your ceiling score. All right. So um, that's just you know helpful information for students taking that kind of test. And then you have all this kind of data, right? So you have diagnostic score data. How'd you do in advanced math, how'd you do in algebra, how'd you do in geometry and trigonometry, how'd you do in problem solving and data analysis. Um, you know, uh, those are those are things to to think about um, that can help you prepare, right? Oh, I didn't do as well in, in algebra. Like I can, I could study those formulas, I could study those concepts and that can help me score better. Uh, I, you know, I did really well in problem solving and I don't need to work on that as much. And then here's an example of what our platform looks like. You know, you have the time it took you to take a question. You have the type, you have the difficulty, you have the question here, you have your answer, and you could see 
this student selected C, which was wrong. D was correct. You can see the percentage of students that get the question right. Then there's the solution. And then there's a follow-up exercise. So this is like the level of detail that, you know, that we provide that you'd want to seek out when you're kind of preparing for this kind of test. Uh, yeah, so uh, any questions? I know I went through a lot there, but happy to answer those. I'll give you guys a second just to type those up. In the meantime, I just want to show you guys what the blue book looks like. Let me see here. While you're typing those up, let me share my screen again. So this is what the Blue Book practice app for the SAT looks like. Um, you know, you have the tests, so you could do a, a full-length practice test. You can click SAT or you can click, you know, PSAT, you click SAT, click the test you want to do, and then you hit next, and it will actually pull up a test. And you could actually do a practice SAT on it. Um, the ACT doesn't have something like this. Um, you can see this is what it looks like. You have the question, and then you click your answer. You can do you could do like a strikeout. There's like a lot of little tools here. You can mark it for a review. You can annotate, uh, write yourself a little note, like you select text, annotate, and then you could type something here. Um, so there's a lot of little tools that you could use. And then as how you go through the test, you could skip around if you want. Wouldn't recommend that, but you can. And that's pretty much how the, uh, the Blue Book app works. All right, looks like we do have a few questions. Yeah, so the students that uh, a lot of students just took the digital PSAT. The PSAT was digital this year. So, you know, we're definitely waiting to see how students do on that. So I'm glad you took that. That's a great first experience. If you did do that, um, you can then just take a diagnostic ACT. Um, and then you could use those two to prepare. My daughter toured a campus that doesn't require SAT scores. Is that becoming more popular? There's there's a big difference between doesn't require and won't take. So just because they don't require it doesn't mean that you don't want to send it in, right? Like the, the, when, when you do a tour um, and you're talking to a student, especially a student rep, they're not really giving you an accurate picture of like what it takes to get into this, these schools. Many of these schools are extremely competitive, right? So um, if you want to be competitive at the school, uh, you probably want to send in a score. So, you know, if a school has an average SAT score of a 1450 and you have a 93 average and you don't send in a test score, you're very highly unlikely to get in. Now on the tour, they'll tell you like, yeah, it's all good. Just send it in, but they don't work in the admissions office. You know what I mean? Like they're just telling you what's easiest to explain. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you hear on tours, even in meetings, you know, you have to really press the school to like tell you what the real honest answer is. Like, how do I get myself into this school? And a lot of it is very circumstantial. I think that's one of the important things to remember is, you know, they're looking at each student individually as they say they are. So, you know, if you have exceptional, uh, really truly exceptional other aspects to your application, then you probably could get in without a test score. But what is exceptional in their eyes is very difficult to determine. Uh, let's see. If one is wanting to do the digital test, when can you start registering for that? It starts in March. Uh, yes, uh, I think you could actually register register for it now. Um, let me see. I'm actually looking at it. Yeah, you could register for it now. I'm pretty sure. Um, it takes a while, but um, I would recommend registering for that. If you do have like a, your school may be giving the digital SAT sometime in March. Uh, in your school. So if they, if they do that in your high school, then you probably want to do that. Uh, and then you could look at taking it a different time in, in May or June or something like that. Um, but if your school gives it, you'd probably want to take advantage of that. That's a newer thing. Uh, schools used to really predominantly give the SAT on Saturday. Um, now a lot of schools are giving it on Wednesday or like other weekdays. 
um, to make it a little bit easier for kids with a digital digital test. That's a kind of a new trend I've noticed. But you know, every school is different. It depends on your individual high school. If one, uh, let's see, uh, up until when can kids retest late in their senior year? Uh, yeah, you can take the test as many times as you want. Um, obviously, there's a certain limit of like what would be successful. Uh, you know, you don't want to take it seven times. I mean, at that point, you probably have kind of maxed out, but excuse me. Um, yeah, usually the, the, the flow that I recommend is a student takes it in the, in the spring. So um, typically I'd recommend a student takes it in December, but this year it's the paper SAT, not the digital SAT. So you have that transition, but say we didn't have this transition. Like, so say you have a 10th grader, um, I would start preparing, take the test in December, take the test in March, and then evaluate whether you want to take it again in June or in senior year, you really can take it up until now. Like students just took their last attempt in October uh, because like I said, a lot of the applications need to be sent in on like November 1st. So people want their stuff done before it needs to be sent in. Uh, you know, so that's a lot of times the last try is, is this time of year, senior year. So um, you do want to take it multiple times. There's something called super scoring, if anyone knows what that is, which is basically where um, you can take the test multiple times and take your best score. Like say you do really well in math one time and really well on English the next time, you can actually put those two together and have what's called a super score. So that's something that, you know, is usually beneficial to doing well. You can actually use it to your advantage. If you do take the SAT and you do really well one time, then uh, on math, you can just maybe basically stop studying for that as much and predominantly study for English. And that's what like, you know, people like myself help people do is like, you know, navigate through, you know, this process and get the most out of it. So um, that that's something I would recommend. That's why students should take at least twice, if not three. I mean, once you hit like four is really probably the most I would see a student do around here. Um, obviously people are going to do whatever they want to do. I mean, you know, some students do it once and do really well and they never have to take it again. So uh, that's probably less common, but you know, it depends, you know, if you're saying I must get a 1400 to get into X, Y, and Z school, then you're going to take the test as many times as you need to get it. If you say, you know what, I try my best. I just don't really care anymore. Then that's fine too. You know, it's a person kind of a personal, uh, decision. What is considered a good score? Is the objective to get 1600 or anything about 1500 should be enough for competitive schools? Great question. You definitely don't have to get a 1600. Um, a extremely small fraction of people per year get that number. Uh, extremely, extremely small, like less than 0.1%. Uh, I think for, the, it, it depends on what type of competitive you're talking about. If you're talking about like the top 10 schools in the country, then yeah, you're probably going to need a 1540 is really kind of like the magic number there. Uh, if you're talking about schools more in the top, but not the, you know, Ivy level, like, you know, something slightly below that or near that, where you talk about like the top 30 schools, then something in the high 1400s, low 1500s would probably work. Um, many other schools tier below that are going to be 1350 to 14 something. Um and then there's a, you know, there's just, there's, a, you know, there's a wide variety of schools that will accept different scores. You know, if you have a 1200, there's still many schools that would want to see that, you know, it just depends on what schools you're applying to. You know, you could, it's like a chicken or the egg, like which came first thing is, you know, do you look at the schools first and you try to engineer your score to get there? Or do you look at the, at the scores, what your score is first and then determine, you know, what schools you can get into, you know, so. Um, it's, 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 it's a personal decision to, for the most part. Any other questions there? All right, looks like that's it for now. Thank you so much, Nick, um, for coming on and explaining all of that. Again, a deep dive into a lot of information. Um, for all of them that have signed up for this call, we will make sure that y'all get the recording um, so that you can digest the information and really start to plan out for your um, college roadmap. And I was about to say, Nikki's about to send out the poll. It's going to pop up on y'all's screen. So if you could just take a few seconds, 
um, answer the questions and we would greatly appreciate it. And again, next week we will be having Mark Dunlop with Survivor Outreach Services come on to talk about uh, scholarships, military scholarships, financial considerations for uh, our military survivor kids and all things that surround that to include milestone information. So we are very thankful for all of our um, partners who come on and give these briefs because I definitely could not go through that much information. Y'all are amazing. Yeah, thank you. This was very fun. I love doing these things. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. And again, he's with Curve Breakers. He is uh, on TikTok. He goes over more information for college success. So find him on TikTok. I don't, do you want to say your handle? Nick the Tutor. All right. Find him on TikTok, Nick the Tutor. Awesome. Thank and Nikki so just dropped his website in the chat as well. Yeah, that's great for any you know, people who want more information about the difference between the two tests. Um, and if anyone does want to take any kind of diagnostic assessment, of course, we can provide that for free for you guys. So no, no problem. All right. Thank you all. And this concludes our session today. Thank you.